taproot analysis, uh, operational improvements, and the development of world-class health and management systems. Ken ha has also developed in in industrial rehabilitation centers for top leading hospitals, including the U.S. Uh, World and Report's uh, top 100 hospitals. In the last five years, under Ken's guidance, Rhea Magnet Wire has reduced their injury rates by 94% and workers' compensation exposure by over 4.1 million. In 2007, Rhea Magnet Wire was awarded one of America's top 10 safety comp safest companies by Occupational Hazards Magazine. Ken has also guided Rhea Magnet Wire Las Cruces, New Mexico facility to be recognized as one of Industry Week's magazine's top 25 manufacturing facilities in the United States for 2007 2008. Ken's success led him to be the first therapist nationally to have his own radio talk program focusing on injury prevention, ergonomics, and health promotion. As well as be, being a contributing editor for EHS Magazine, his industrial injury reduction successes have been featured in Advanced Magazine, Health Week Magazine, OT Week, and Occupational Hazards Magazine. Ken was awarded for his successful techniques by being named a recipient of the 2006 J.J. Keller National Safety Professional of the Year. Welcome, Ken. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I hope, uh, can people in the back hear me okay with this? I just, good, okay. I just did a seminar uh, for Georgia Tech a couple weeks ago, and the last time I wore one of these, I got in trouble. I didn't forgot to turn it off, and you know the old nightmare when you walk to the bathroom, and you know it's still on. It, not not a good thing. So, um, I don't know what a tougher presentation would be: the one right after lunch, or the one right before the boat trip. So, please bear with me. We'll we'll kind of get you through this and get all your questions answered and, and go from there. Uh, you know, I knew I was going to hit that button. Here we go. Okay, today's agenda. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the history of ray magnet wire, uh, what we do, and then take a look at some of our metrics and take a look at some of the challenges that we face and then get into what really safety systems, uh, what they should be incorporating, uh, some, of the, some of the home runs that I've seen over the years and that I've talked to other leading corporations that deal in safety as well as their operational metric about what they do. I'm going to give you some examples as well, too. And then at the very end, uh, we're going to put on uh, my therapist ergonomics hat. We're going to show you some really, really common examples, bad examples of uh, high-risk scenarios that we put our employees in every day that could result in a strain or sprain, cumulative trauma disorder, decker veins, carpal tunnel, all those good words right behind there. So with that, we're going to certainly have a little fun here to kick this off. Uh, I need two people who think they can make a pretty good paper airplane. You've got to come up here. I'm sorry. It's the last part of the day. I need two people. I don't want to choose anybody. Come on. Who got? Come on up here. One more. No one wants to move. Come on up here. All right. And you are? Randy. Randy. Nice to meet you. You stand in front of here. That's your paper. Wow. Don't do that. And you are? Lee. Lee. Nice to meet you. Okay, that's your paper. Okay, now I need an official timer. Who's got a second hand? Okay, thank you. Uh, what we're going to do in one minute, here's the objective. The objective is, is that you'll, make your, you'll construct your paper airplane, and then you're going to throw it up at the target. Okay, we'll keep score. Who gets the most points here? You've got one minute to make your plane and then throw it as many times as you possibly can to get the points, and we'll see who wins. The object here is to hit that target, okay, as much as you possibly can with the most points. Everybody got it? Okay, you got my timer? Okay, ready and go. Okay. I'll kind of construct what's going on up here. We're, what they're doing, certainly they're working feverishly, okay, taking his time. Lee is, Randy, making some pretty tight folds, try to get it up there. Okay, timer's still timing. No pressure, guys. Don't worry about this. I'll throw them back at you when you throw. Just go. Just go. Hey, there's a 50. Good. Yours, yours went back of this. Yeah. Didn't? Okay. Keep going. Don't wait for him. Okay. There's 75. 
25, good. Now you're in trouble. Okay, there's another 50. How are we doing on time? Seven seconds. Throw one more up there. Okay, and we'll stop right from there. I was going to get yours in back. Give these guys a hand, first of all, making a paper airplane. Thanks. Good job. Okay, what do we see up here? What went on? Well, what went on is they took, uh, Randy took, Randy really went to, went to town, made sure his creases were real nice and tight, threw it up there and got as many shots as he possibly could. Okay, but what happens then in the world of manufacturing, the world of safety, your competition moves into town. Okay, they take a look at that same solution. We've heard all day about uh, presentations, about taking a look with fresh pair of eyes. But let's say your competition comes into town and says, you know what, gee, what is the objective? The objective is what? Hit the target, right? Okay, competition comes into town and says, you know, I got a better idea. I can go quicker. Okay, I can get more shots. I can keep firing. I've allowed my process to have some variability. Of course, my throw stinks. Have some process in my variability. But I can get more shots in a minute because I've looked at that process differently and I can get that job done quicker, cheaper, more efficient, more on target. And what happened there is that when I said, who could come up and make a paper airplane, we've already, in our mind, said, this is what a paper airplane is supposed to look like. Okay? How many of you out in the audience weren't thinking to do just that, crumple it up there? Usually a lot of people do. Okay? We've painted ourselves in a box to say, this is what a paper airplane is supposed to look like. And unfortunately, in the world of safety, we do the same thing. This is what safety is supposed to look like. We're going to do it because... We're going to save costs. We're going to do it because it's just kind of the right thing to do. Or we're going to do it because OSHA tells us we have to do it, and we got fined, and we got to do it to make sure we get, off, get them off our backs. Okay? What we need to focus on today is that golden nugget. What are we doing differently here, or what has Ray done differently, or can you take something to make sure that you think outside that box in the world of safety? So that's what the whole pre the premise of this presentation is going to be, is are we doing something different, or can we give you something different that you could go back, you could tweak, you could make your own, you could make it better. We're all about continuous improvement here. Okay, little history of Ray Magnet Wire. Here is our North American locations. These are my coverage zones. Okay, we are, what does Magnet Wire do, or Ray Magnet Wire do? We take copper and aluminum wire, we draw it down. Some people may call it stretching, but we actually draw it down, heat up the wire to whatever uh, gauge or diameter that our customer wants. The product that goes in is large generators, small generators, appliances, automotive. Uh, it pulls the cable cars out in San Francisco. Uh, our scrap actually <clears throat> makes the, uh, or is put into the dust mass, the, uh, the metal clip there. Okay, which is now very, very popular with this flu epidemic that's coming out. Okay? So that's exactly what we do. Now, we have uh, broken up into two divisions. We have a magnet wire division. We also have what we call an Algonquin division. Our product could be either insulated or non-insulated, and that really breaks, by, breaks down basically what our divisions are all about. Okay? We do have also have China operations as well, too. Now, within safety, we consider safety as a value. Okay, safety is also a line function. We've heard a lot about today about giving people the empowerment of the control on the line to fix what they need to fix, to make sure it's safe, to empower them to say, if something's not safe, we're not going to run it until it gets safe. Okay, real key. Also, we like to take a look at safety as, an, as a very key indicator as an operational success. We spend a lot of time in boardroom meetings saying, you know, what's our profit? Okay, what's our margins? What's our quality? And then safety never gets mentioned. Okay, companies that lead in safety will put safety as a key operational metric, and I'll teach you a couple of the metrics that we use. Also, it should be a whole system design going in with that. Quality production and safety should be of equal value. You can't make a product with high quality when you're putting people at risk because you'll injure people, and then you're going to be paying uh, over time to get somebody in there to help them out. Okay. Also, values and commitment. This is kind of a, a core of what we believe, but everybody is, ha, that works for us, everybody that else should work for you as well too, has the right to work in a safe environment. They have the right to be trained and equipped to do their job safely. 
Okay. They also, once they're trained and given the right equipment, they should be accountable for the quality of their work and doing their job safely. Now, we talk about levels of commitment. We've heard that a lot today in the other uh, presenters' programs. And back before I worked with Ray, I, I had a consulting company, and I'm going to show you a video clip of a little bit about commitment and what we mean by commitment. And let me explain actually the injury that happened on this job. Uh, this is a job uh, in a foundry, and, uh, and you'll see when the video clip runs, uh, what these two gentlemen are doing is they're taking parts and they're breaking them up. Okay? Now, what happened is, is one of the parts during the breakup portion came back, hit a gentleman in the private area, okay? and crushed both of his private areas. Okay? Now, very serious injury. So I was called out to take a video clip. And as we run this video clip, you'll see basically how that could happen. Okay. This is what they do 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Okay? They take the product, they smash it apart. Now, do I have any engineers in here? Everybody's afraid to raise their hand. What would you do engineering this job? How would you make this job safer? Anybody can shout it out. It doesn't have to be engineers. What would you do? What's that? Give them a cutting tool. Anything else? <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> so mechanically? Okay, redesign the part. Give them a cup. I've heard that one before. How about a shield? Okay. Well, I'm putting my recommendations together, and I get a phone call from the company. It says, Ken, you know, we'll pay you for your service, but we've actually we fixed, the, we fixed the solution. We came up with a solution. We fixed the problem. I said, okay, what would you do? Of course, I had to ask. To this day, okay, a female does this job. Okay? <laughs> to this day. You talk about commitment. You talk about culture. What exactly are you telling your employees? How valuable they are. Really bad move. Now, one more video clip here. Called out to this job. This person doing this task right here is a new employee. Why is he a new employee? Because the other employee got injured seriously on this job doing exactly what he's doing in the video clip. These products are very, very, very heavy. It fell off the hoist attachment that this gentleman was using, fell on his foot, crushed his foot, lost his foot. The gentleman in the background is his supervisor. Let's run this clip here in a second. You want to talk about commitment again, too, is watch this person struggle to hook this up. Now watch his supervisor's head in the background. Sits here, watches him. He'll shake his head. What an idiot. I can't believe he's doing that. Okay? You can kind of see. First of all, it's a point. Of why wouldn't he be using a sling through that so it doesn't fall off? Okay? Bad situation. Now, I will admit, when I first videotaped this clip, I didn't see the supervisor in the background going like this. So I went back, reviewed the tape, went back to him the next day and said, why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you help him? Okay? And his response to me was, I've done this job for 15 years. I went through hard knocks, and he's going to do the same thing. Okay? Guys, that happens in your company. It happens in my company all, all the time with new employees. New employees usually get brought in, and the worst jobs, the strenuous jobs, temp employees are brought in because we don't put our people into it. We'll, we'll put temp employees on it, have them do the work. Okay? We'll outsource it. Okay? We're hearing stuff like that, and what we have to do is make sure how do we keep our jobs safe? How do we get the right culture how do we get the right commitment to where it needs to be? Now, we'll talk a little bit about performance metrics. One of the things that we use is uh, total incident rate. We call it SIIR, which is Serious Injury Incident Rate. So that is a total recordable rate. Also, workers' compensation expenditures, successfully completing an a EHS corporate audit as well as completion of uh, safety and health objectives, and we'll get into those in a little bit. Now, here is our ugly past, and I show this, and at times I have people in our company say, why do you have to show them how bad it was in the past? Because if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going to go. You have to. I have, we have nothing to hide, guys. And what I'll tell you what right now, back in 1996, 97, 98, we're injuring almost 18% of our workforce. That's an incident rate. Okay, we were at 18%. We finished 2008 at 1.0. Okay, 
Okay, we have goals to get a lot lower and continue to drive it. Now, we also do a lot with control charts. Taking a look, do, is our process in control? We want to see the variance get tighter. We want to see the means coming down. The actual types of injuries that we see within our industry that is very typical are strains, cuts, contusions, and fractures. Very, very common. Now, when I was brought, on, brought in in 2003 to help them out, uh, one of my selling points, real tough selling point, to our CEO was, I know strains and sprains are your number one injury. You bring me in year one, those are going to go up. Okay? Now, he's looking at me like, why am I hiring you or why are you coming in here? Okay? And I said, here's the reason why they're going to go up just year one. Because right now I can guarantee you you're underreporting. You are underreporting. You've got people that are going home every day, aches, pains, maybe some numbness in their hand, and they're not reporting it. They'll report it when it's too late, when it's time for surgery, when it's time for them to be in rehab. And guess what? They're not a return on your investment anymore because they're not working for you. They're at a therapist's office. Okay? They're at a chiropractor's office. They're trying to get better. Okay, we're going to get the early detection of these to lay the foundation that down the road we're not going to have strains and sprains. And what we do is we look at our strains and sprains on a control chart. We finished last year at 0 .04 from an incident rate just with strains and sprains. Our average age of our workforce on the floor is 46 years old. Okay, it is not uncommon for us to have people that have worked for us 25, 30 years. Okay, and the work that we do is not light work. Within our industry, the incident rate within our industry is 10.1, and we finish 1.0. Again, we've had a 94% reduction in our work comp. Our insurance mod factor, we technically are self-insured right now, but our mod factor went from 140 down to 84. Substantial cost savings, and it was mentioned earlier, we are recognized as one of America's top 10 safest companies. Uh, in 2007, along with nine other outstanding corporations. Okay. Also, some recognition that we'll show is that we like to partner up with OSHA where we can, and we have, uh, because of the size of some of these locations, we uh, applied for the OSHA SHARP Award, very similar to a VPP, uh, and we have three SHARP Awards. Our Mexican facility we hold in the same uh, standards as OSHA, and uh, they certainly won, they won an award called the Industrial Olympia Award, which is very, very uh, uh, stringent in environmental as well as safety. In a nutshell, here is the process. Here is what safety programs, in my opinion, in my expertise, should be made of. Starts here at the yellow bubble. Okay, we've all talked about setting the goal, setting the strategic plan of the corporation. What are they? From there, it should develop into benchmarking. You know, do you benchmark with your competition? Do you benchmark with other companies that are like you? Do you benchmark with top leading companies in safety about what they do, how they do it? Get that information. Make your process better. Now, the four blue, I'm sorry, the three blue bubbles are the critical process. I've talked to many, many top leading corporations in safety and ask them what do they do, and the common theme is these, these three blue bubbles. First and foremost, there is an assessment and a standardization of the entire process. Do you do, is your process standardized? Okay, do you, when I came into to Ray Magnet Wire, every one of our processes in our eight locations at the time were doing the same thing but eight different ways. Okay, eight different lockout tagout programs, eight different confined space programs. Okay, we need to standardize that, and there's a reason we'll get into it in a little bit. Also, behavioral based safety, which is really a kind of a key word nowadays. By a show of hands, anybody do BBS programs at all? Okay, very few. Last but not least is an employee engagement program. We've heard a lot about that already today, getting your employees engaged, and we'll tell you exactly what that is here in a little bit. Obviously, the execute plan, track your results, and guess what? That cycle never stops. It's a continuous process operation, continuous process for safety. Now, with this process, even in my consulting years, 
You get people, and you start showing some results, and you may run into it as well, but you get people saying, yeah, we did something, but the results were lucky. How can you prove that what you did was actually effective or just luck or random? Okay? I've heard that many, many, many times. So what I end up doing is let's take a look at what we did and when we did it and break it down by stages. And these are the stages with the blue bubbles with the acronyms at the bottom and what we did. So also took a look at control chart breaking down in the stages. We want to make sure that we've got control in our process per stage. And then let's take it a step further and do what we call a test for equal variances to make sure that there is statistical difference between stages and sta each stages. And there are. So you can go back and say, look, these things are not done by luck. It is not. There, there's no luck involved in here. It's a process. And we've heard a lot about that. It's a methodology. The only difference that I've seen in what... I've done here in the past with corporations, and what some other folks have done is they've put the behavioral base first and assessment standardization second. It's just a philosophy. And my philosophy was you have to have standardization, you have to have the foundation built before you go, go ahead and start talking about behavioral based. Okay? It's just a philosophy. Let's talk a little bit about procedures here. And this is where the standardization come in. And now we're going to hit home the, the three uh, blue bulleted points that we talked about. First of all, policies. You should have your policies standardized within facilities. All your policies should either clarify or exceed any type of OSHA, DOT regulations. You should expect to go above and beyond. Keep in mind that OSHA is the bare minimum of what you should be doing. And I know OSHA gets a bad, bad name to them, and they're really going to get a bad name to them in 2009 when they start coming out and start hammering people on electrical uh, arc flash analysis. Okay, they're going to get people on general duty clause with that. But what you need to do is you need to start having your locations take ownership for policies. Just You don't have to show of hands, but how many people have had policies developed from corporate and pushed down to the business units, and the business units do it just because corporate told you to do it, and it's, it's a program that it's just done because corporate told us we have to do it. Okay, there's no ownership in that process. We've developed a way to make sure that there is ownership in that process, and we'll get to that under our corporate audit structure because we demand that they take that policy, they make it their own. Not only do they make it their own, they make it better, and not only do they make it better, they better share it with every one of our other locations. Okay? And we, we audit up against that. Now, when I do a lot of best practice safety shares with our suppliers and our customers, and I get, that's great that you guys talk safety, but what is your safety like in the boardroom? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it's like. I make a presentation uh, to our board saying, this is what we're doing. These are where we're at versus uh, we're currently at against our metrics. This is our, these are our tactical goals. These are our future objectives. Every meeting that we have will be led with a safety share. Okay, five minutes, maximum ten minutes of something that may have happened to a person on the way to work. But one of our owners, we have four owners, we're privately held. One of our owners will stand up and do a safety share. Very first thing we kick off any meeting. We have suppliers or customers meetings. We'll kick off every one of those meetings with the safety share. Okay, it really sets the tone that safety is in the forefront of what we do. We also look for opportunities for community outreach. When you have a safety system that you're proud of, which I'm sure everybody in this room does, you need to try to give back to the community. Do seminars, do presentations, find a way to share within the community great community relations for yourself. Now, we've heard a lot about getting people involved. Okay? And a question I usually get asked is, what is your involvement, certainly for your supervisors and managers? Well, within Ray Magnet Wire, and also in very good leading organizations, every safety or every supervisor or manager will have a safety metric for them. That may vary, and the safety metric may be how many toolbox topics do you, do you lead? Uh, how engaged are you in safety projects? How many safety projects are you on? Within your department, what is your incident rate number? Okay, what is in, within your department, what is your work comp cost per employee goals? Okay, it may vary, and what I'll tell you right now is it doesn't matter what those safety metrics are, but you need to put safety metrics on your supervisors and managers. Fact, you need to get safety down within the organization. Secondly, we do, um, again, customer suppliers best practice shares 
Again, we start all meetings with safety shares, and we run emergency drills. Now, how many people here have AEDs within their facilities? Okay, a good amount. Now, you don't have to show a share of hands here, but if you have AEDs, I really hope you're doing AED mock drills. Okay, if you don't, you will be surprised when you start doing them. Okay, you need to do AED drills. When we first did them, we trained them. It was less than a week after we did training for folks that we did a mock drill. Flat out, we would have killed the person. Okay, you have to do drills. Now, not only do, should you do drills, you should also do drills and get people involved at a very high level. Let me do some explaining of who's in this. We did a mock drill, and we get very creative. We're now combining drills with environmental spills and uh, heart attacks and, and cuts, you name it. Around Halloween, people love me. I'll go in and buy fake blood. Okay, They're looking at me like I'm a little weird, even more than I normally am. We'll, f we'll buy fake blood, and we'll go out and throw over a piece of equipment, have an employee drop on the floor, splash him on him, and walk away. We want to see that mock drill. We want to see how effective are you. Very critical that you do that and do it often. Now, here's a mock drill that we did. We actually used a, a resuscitation ante in this one, did a mock AED drill in an actual trailer bed. Now, what you're looking at is the people that are on the ground are our emergency response team, but people in the background, the first person here, uh, first person there is the plant manager taking notes with the badge there. person behind him is we actually hired a nurse to come in to say, you audit us yourself and how we're doing in AEDs. Okay, are we effective as we need to be? The person with his arm folded in the back is a supervisor in that area, and the lady next to him is the safety director at that facility. Okay, also, videotape your drills. Grade your drills, videotape. There's things that happen in your drills that you will never know of unless you videotape it. After every drill, you go into a conference room, the people that were involved, you bring that video up and you analyze it. And you go through what do we do right and where's opportunities for improvement, and you put an action plan together for that. Specifically, if you have AEDs, okay, average age of a heart attack is what? Anybody guess? 44. 44. Anybody know how far an AED should be, how, how far or how you should place your AEDs within your facility? You should get the AED to a person within. How many minutes after you find them? Okay. It's three minutes. Okay. Once you find them, you should get them on end. The chance of survival goes down 10% for every minute that goes by. Time, how quickly? Point A to point B, you get your AEDs there. Critical. Some technology things that we've kind of honed in on. People here, I imagine you have multi-site locations, correct? Everybody shaking their heads? If you have an event happen in one of your locations, how quickly does one of your other locations understand that event? In other words, we had an issue, several issues, in our Las Cruces, New Mexico facility. By the time that hit our Guilford, Connecticut facility of what happened, it would probably be at the end of the month in a safety meeting that we go to. Okay? Well, if that happened on January 1st, and we're, they're not getting the information now until, let's say, January 30th, we've then put people at exposure for 29 days. Unacceptable. So we've tried to develop a system. How can we get it on the floor into the people, to the experts' hands as quickly as we possibly can? We developed a system called a daily safety report. If an event happened within Las Cruces, New Mexico, we can get it on the floor Toolbox meeting, instruction with pictures within our Guilford, Connecticut site in less than 10 minutes. And that's exactly what we do. And this is how we do it. There's two phases of this. <clears throat> 7 o'clock every morning, there's a report that gets kicked out for the last 24 hours. It's a summary report. And you can see those are all our locations down the left-hand side. A zero incident day means nothing happened that day. That means it's a good day. No incidents, no near misses. Okay, no injuries, etc. It keeps track of how many zero days we had, first days, medicals, and you can read the list all the way right down the line. If something did happen, okay, a report would kick up saying LAF, our Lafayette site, 
Okay, and I'll read it for the folks that can't read it. Here's exactly what happened. It said, during the process of putting away finished goods, Mike made contact and bent the storage rack support leg. He attempted to turn his forks around at the time of the incident. For safety reasons, the rack was unloaded uh, in caution tape in the, in the work order that had been written for the reports. Okay? Every incident report will come with a picture. You have to take a picture with it. Send it along. That incident report, you could print, click, present to the folks who need to know that information right on the floor, all locations within 10 minutes. Now, does anybody, any of these people work for you, Mr. or Mrs.? I don't know who did it. Okay, when it comes to forklifts, you know, you get the old bangs on the forklift, you walk past, where'd that new bump come from? I don't know. I know, we got a lot of I don't knows, or had a lot of I don't knows. Now, uh, PMs on forklifts are not cheap. Okay, PMs on poles that you're digging are cheap as well either. Okay, so one of the systems that we looked at within Ray Magnet Wire, one of our things, our, our highest risk for a fatality is going to be forklift traffic. So we take this very seriously in a product that we looked at is called Shockwatch. Has anybody ever heard of Shockwatch or used Shockwatch? Do you use it? Okay, do you use it? Okay. Shockwatch is an impact device, an impact sensor. Now, very, very, very cheap in terms of damage to put it and install it on one forklift. You can get it, you get it bought and installed on a forklift for about $1,200. Okay, very cheap. Now, what it does, it's kind of unique, it sits on a forklift. And you dial in the sensitivity of the bump that you're going to allow that forklift to go through. Now, what happens is, is throughout the entire location, throughout your entire facility, it has an Ethernet ra internet radio. It picks up wherever you're at. It knows who's on it. And how does it know who's on it? Because that operator has one key. For me to get on that truck, I've got the key. I put the key on. It already logs in. Ken Vandenberg, you're on that truck. Okay, now... If I'm driving and I wham into something, what will happen is the alarm will go off the forklift, will shut down, boom. Supervisor has the key to come and turn it back on. We know who was on the truck. We know what happened. There's accountability factor to it. Now, when we take a look at our data, this is the data that I'm going to show you is really kind of during our test run in one of our locations. We really don't have a lot of forklift drivers, although this would appear. But we look at how many hits would a typical forklift, forklift driver have. Okay. Also, how many hours do they drive per hit that they get? Now what we're able to do is start to develop some metrics. And we can say, gee, uh, Terry Snyder at the very bottom, your hours per hit ratio is pretty bad. Okay. We're not going to wait for you to kill somebody or to take down a rack. You're off the truck. And you're off the truck and you're going to get retrained and we're going to get you back on. Okay, now we can start being proactive with forklifts. Very, very critical in what we're trying to do. And last but not least is utilization rates on forklifts. How much is a forklift running? Okay, is it sitting there idle? Okay, we had, in some of our locations, we had utilization rates of our forklifts before we looked at this at 17%. Okay. I also heard in one of the presentations earlier a sense of entitlement to workstations. We actually had employees say, this is my forklift. I'm the only one that's running it. Okay, you're not going to let the person of second shift run the forklift. This is my forklift. And we had to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Who bought this forklift? Okay, is it your forklift or is it not? And really take a step back. Utilization rates. So we actually sold off a bunch of forklifts we didn't need to really balance out our utilization rates. Now, our bumps that we're getting, 07, 08, and even 09, is nil. Okay, you want to talk a quick ROI, very quick. Folks that have had Shockwatch, have you seen hopefully similar results? Okay, although this particular device does not monitor speed, there's another device that, that does that. We have found folks, because they believe Big Brother's watching, will automatically slow down their pace, and maybe folks that use them may notice the same thing, hopefully. Now, let's talk a little bit about a serious incident focus. By a quick show of hands, how many people here would say that strains and sprains or cumulative traumas are their number one risk factor within their company? Okay. 
Just about every hand went up in this room. It is a major epidemic that we're dealing with in manufacturing. I'm going to show you a little tool, a little device that we have used, and then I can make it available to you later. I can email it to you if you want it. But first of all, how damaging is it? The, according to the National Safety Council, the average cost of a strain and sprain is $17,101. That is a definition of sunk cost. You will not get that back. Done. Workers' comp is sunk cost. You're not getting it back. This massively ugly-looking thing is a spreadsheet that I've put together. Uh, actually, it is an ANSI tool. You can jot this down. I can email it to you as well. Uh, it's an ANSI Z365 assessment tool. I've used this tool about, well, about 12 years. It is the best tool out there to prevent strains and sprains, if you know how to use it. This is a tool that will tell you when a strain and sprain is going to happen before it occurs. I've never heard that before. Okay? But I've been in consulting world. I've gone through and said, don't even show me your OSHA logs. Let me run this report. And when I'm done, I come back and say, you've got carpal tunnel here. You've got shoulder problems here. You've got rotator cuff problems here. You lay it over the OSHA 300 log, and that's what it's telling you. Okay? That's how effective this is. Let me show you how, real briefly how this works. I'm going to really give you the cliff note version of this. This is usually I do a seminar, lasts about eight hours to do this, but it's really easy once you understand it. It looks at non-physical factors that make a job stressful combined with physical factors. You multiply them together to come up with a number. There's a maximum number that you should not exceed. Engineers love this tool because there's numbers they can crunch into it. But first of all, there's six questions you ask yourself, real simply yes or no questions. If you have a yes in any of it, you give it a rating of a one in that question. Number one, is it a machine-paced task? Is it incentive pay, yes or no? Is it routine over? Do you have routine overtime for that task? Is there electric monitoring, and what is that? There is some manufacturing facilities that they have cameras looking down into work cells, and someone's job is to sit in another room and make sure that other people are working. Okay, That's still out there. Uh, is there little decision to control their environment, yes or no? And is it monotonous work, yes or no? It talks about culture. What you do is you add all those up and you get what we call work organizational score. On that assessment tool, that will show up right down in that yellow section. Now, when we look at the physical factors, I'm going to try to make this look a little bit easier for you. And I'm going to take this whole section and I'm going to get rid of it. Now, when we talk ergonomics in prevention, you're going to look at the, the six home runs here. It looks at motion, posture, the velocity of movement, the repetition, how long you're doing that task for, and then the force. Notice how it doesn't even have anywhere in terms of the weight. 100 pounds, 150 pounds, 51 pounds. doesn't care. Let me show you how this works. I'll give you an example of this. Here's a job task where we had somebody perform shoulder flexion. Okay. Here's a company I consulted with. They took automotive fans, weighed less than two pounds, and up here all day long, putting fans up, okay, all day long. Now, they had shoulder injuries, substantial shoulder injuries with this, uh, shoulder bursitis as well. When you look at this job, job task, sh her shoulder movements were between 45 and 90 and over 90 degrees, okay? She did this between 90 and 150 times an hour. She did this job over four hours, and she was applying a force because a lot of times it got stuck to get it in the, in the uh, rack. Now, when you put this to the tool, on this particular job, they had routine overtime, and they had little decision to control the environment. The way the racks were brought to her is the way they were at. They did not want to give her a step stool or a ladder because they felt it would be a trip hazard. Now, taking a look at the physical end of it, okay, 45 to 90, and over 90 is a rating of a 3. She worked at a slow movement, which is good. Okay. Repetition rate, 90 to 150 times an hour, which is a 1. She did the job over 4 hours, which is 2. And is there a force, yes or no? Yes, there was, and it was a 2. Multiplying all that together, <clears throat> she was at a 9.6. Maximum limit should be a 6. Now, the question is, what do you do? You take a look at that tool and say, where can we make the biggest impact? Where can we start chopping this systemically? And can we do anything about routine overtime? Can we give her an opportunity to control her environment? Can we get her out of that extreme posture? That would be a huge home run if you can get that three down. 
Okay, slow rate, you don't need to touch. Repetition rate, can we decrease that? If you do that, everybody's like, whoa, 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 that's productivity. I'll give you an opportunity to look at that and say, you can speed up lines and still keep your people safe. Okay, this tool will also do that. Task duration, can we do a job rotation? And can we decrease the force? So here's exactly what happened. Now, keep in mind, these weren't my recommendations. These were the employees' recommendations, the experts of that job. So let's do an adjustable table. We're going to do a job rotation. We'll do a stacking matrix. Okay? Here's what they did. They put it on a scissor lift, okay? a pallet, scissor pallet lift. So every time she was able to put the product into the uh, racks, she was able to, with a foot pedal, raise and lower it so she didn't have to stoop over it. She didn't have to reach her shoulders up ahead. Now, let's take a look at that same assessment tool. These are decisions that the company made that I didn't make. They got rid of the routine overtime. They gave her the ability to control her environment by giving her an adjustable table and everybody else there for that matter. We didn't touch repetition rate, so all the ops people are pretty happy. We didn't need to touch force, okay? Not in this tool at all, but what we did is we got her out of this position 8, 10, 12 hours a day, and we got her to here, okay? And that took a 3 down to a 0. And what happens is we now made that job a 4 out of a 6 as opposed to a 9.6 out of a 6. When you could say when you do that, that a person will not get a shoulder injury doing that job, you can say that, and it is proven, okay? The company that we're dealing with here when we came through had a 36.1 incident rate, okay? Horrific. Okay. Within two years, they won the Indiana Chamber of Commerce Most Improved Award. They had an incident rate of 1.2. Okay, just by using a strain and sprain assessment tool and going through the same methodology. Oop. Go back one here. Talk a little bit about audits. How many people here audit, corporately audit their locations? Okay. One of the most powerful tools if you want to change safety culture. <laughs> what we do is we go through and we audit every one of our locations. You can certainly see where it says commitment. These are who sits on my audit team. Our CEO, our two divisional presidents, our VP of purchasing, our CFO, our chief technology officer, myself. Okay, we are the audit team. We come through and we do a two-day audit. You want to get exposure. You want to get eyes opened up to safety. Bring your CEO through, okay, and, make, and they're going to go through. And it doesn't hurt. We just got a new CEO about a year and a half ago. It doesn't hurt that your CEO is an ex-OSHA official. Okay? Real nice plug. There's no, you can't pull the wool over his eyes. It's great. Okay? He knows what he's looking for. Okay? He used to, he used to do, be an OSHA official in the state of Michigan. Now, you can see the subjects that we look at. It is a two-day full wall-to-wall -wall audit. Yes, we do see Hello? Good. We do send our audits out a year in advance, which is fine because the way we audit. The first two years we did the audit, and if you don't do the audit, I recommend doing it this way if you do them, is to go based off of compliance. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing based off of what corporate's expecting you to do? Okay. Compliance. Yes, no. If you're doing it, great. You get 100% and less than that if you're, you're doing less versions of that. Anything less than a 70% would be considered non I don't you need a microphone, but oh, great. I got two. Th I got two things to do, so look out here. Um, usually, if you get below seventy, that's failing. I said earlier that we tried to develop a system that we look for continuous improvements, and this is how we've done it. Now we've, we're away from the compliance. When you get into a compliance type audit. The compliance is, are you doing this? Yes, here's our documentation to prove it. Great, and you move on. Okay, where we're at right now is to get a 70%, yes, you need to be doing what you're expecting to be doing, but you also need to make that process better. You need to not only be showing us by paperwork, we're going to validate it on the floor. Do your employees know what right PPEs they should be wearing based off the job tests that they're doing? 
If you say, yeah, they've all had PPE training, that's, that's great. Let's go on the floor. Let's go find out. Okay, that's where the rubber meet the road. Okay, we're going to find out, do they know? We're going to talk to them. We understand that when the CEO walks on the floor and they start asking people, people get a little nervous. We, we understand that. We try to make it as most relaxed environment as we possibly can, but we'll get enough of a pool to get an understanding, do they know or do they not know? Now, over the years, we've developed our, our scoring system where two years ago, what would have been 100 is now a 70. For you to get above a 70, actually, I'll, I'll give you an example of what 100 should be from a compliance question. A compliance question may ask, do you have a lockout tagout program? Well, in the past, it would be, yes, we do. Here it is. We've done it. We've documented it. We've trained it. Great, that's 100%. Now what we've done is we've said, do you have a lockout tagout program? Yes, here it is. Great. How have you made this process better? How have you taken ownership for this lockout tagout program? That's great. Now, how have you implemented it? How have you trained on it? How have you made the process better? If you've done that, great. Now you're probably talking 80. How have you shared that with Ray Magnet Wire other locations? Are they seeing equal benefits from it? How have you shared this with customers, suppliers to make this better? How are you driving metrics? What are your metrics? Do you have metrics? When you do that, then you start driving continuous improvements. And when you have 8 to 12 locations doing that without losing the integrity of that audit of what you're asking them to do and they're making it better, you're planting the seed and you've got 8 to 12 people making a process better, sharing with other folks what they're doing, how they're doing it, to make it and continuing your process to evolve and continue to grow. It's a critical process. Now, does auditing work? Absolutely, it works. Oops. Because we take a look at, does the audit score reflect where their incident rate scores are at? And we're seeing a pretty good R squared uh, up there of where that's at. So we're getting the value from our audits and we're auditing the right things. We also audit our auditors. Are we being as effective as we possibly can be? If you look, uh, the first one up there is Barkey, which is our COO. He does a great job on his own, but when he's compared with the other divisional president, he's a little too lenient. So we sit down at the end of the audit and says, what's going on, guys? Okay, wh what's happening? How can we improve? How can we make this better? Now, departmental observations. I sat in two sessions ago about a gentleman with 5S. This is crudely after the 5S process and 5S principles. Now, <clears throat> Let me tell you how these developed. When I first came with Ray, um, I used to hear a lot about, you know, we've got to shut down the plant for a half day because we've got ISO coming through tomorrow. Okay, we've got to clean up. Okay, heaven forbid OSHA comes through here, our place is a mess. We've got to clean up. And we said, guys, and I made, a, I made a bold statement, guys, our plant should look today as it looked tomorrow, as it's going to look the next day and next day. You should never have to clean up. Okay? As your process is running, you should always be cleaning up. Uh, I've heard uh, people saying that we give our employees 30 minutes at the end of the work shift to clean up. I'm not a proponent of that philosophy. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But what happens at the end of that 30 minutes and the employee's got to go home, okay, and they said, you know, I'm not going to clean up today. Okay, what do you do with that person? You keep them over? You can pay them overtime to clean up. Okay, it's, it's a nasty web. We should clean up as we do this. Part of what we've done then is we've, we've Called Instead of audits, we called them departmental observations. If you want to get the quickest and biggest bang for your buck from a 5S system, in my opinion, this is it. You tie these results into your supervisor's performance appraisal, okay, the scores. You have a goal or a metric that they should get. Now, you can grade them however you all pass, or if you fail one, you fail the audit, or you can give it on a percent basis. It's up to you. Uh, the results, all results are posted in a general location where everybody can see them, okay? And then last but not least, they are done minimally once a month, and they're done totally at random. These should not be done the first Monday of every month because everybody knows they're going to clean up and they're going to organize. And let me give you a little example. This is, again, crudely off the 5S system. These are things that we put in that we felt was critical for us. Now, over time, our process has evolved, and it's much more detailed than this. But these are our first crack at it, and I thought maybe we'd give you at least these so you guys had the first crack at it. Some of these are typical OSHA violations that, quite honestly, we were sick and tired of telling people about. Okay, you, One of the 
biggest frustrations that I hear in the world of safety is you, you try to fix something and you, you crack down and people say, we got to get this done and fix it. And they fix it. You turn your back and then a day later, it's the same thing. Okay, you haven't controlled anything. So we're trying to put control in this and sustain. So we look at these processes and we audit them. Pass, fail. Now who audits them? Uh, it's a combination of supervisors, of hourly employees, okay, and managers. It depends on the location as well. We also have our CEO audit them. I'll audit them. Okay, so we have a nice wide variety. I'm going to give you some examples, some before and after of where we're at and the impact it's made for us. It took us three years to get to some of these pictures here. These pictures were taken in 2003 when I first were hired. Uh, this is our standard walkway. This is our storage rack. These look pretty good, huh? Trying to get hoses off. How about the cobwebs on those storage racks? Okay, this is a chemical spill kit. It's pretty dirty. This is a, this is a new product that came out. It's an Iowa station slash paper towel holder. I don't know if anybody of you had of those. Okay. One of my biggest pet peeves and a cultural nightmare for folks is don't do what you say that you shouldn't be doing, what you know you shouldn't be doing. Okay. Caution, don't block the shower, and you got barrels all in front of the showers. Okay. This is our anti-trip mat or fatigue mat. Okay. Blocked Iowa station. You can see the, the flammable materials up top. You can see the PPEs draped over the vice. But you can also see maybe the lit cigarette at the bottom of the picture in a flammable area. Okay? So we came from a world of hard knocks. Okay, what's in these bottles? Anybody know? That's the point. Okay, so what did we do? We implemented these departmental observations. Three years later, okay, where are we at now? Well, here's what our facilities look like. Okay, it is a constant process of cleaning, sustaining, and auditing, and putting people accountable for what you should be doing. Okay, this is a maintenance department. You could literally eat off the floor. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could literally eat off the floor in a maintenance department. This is a loading dock. Okay, some equipment in our Mexican facility. That's our distribution area. Okay, and we talked a little bit about 5S uh, in, the, in the presentation, two presentations ago. Okay, we'll move on here to some BBS, some uh, safe behavior. We implemented this in 2004. Here's the thing with BBS for folks who haven't implemented it. With quality, in quality systems, and we all preach top quality, when, a pro when, when you're Working process comes into the front portion of the machine. It goes through the machine. It gets ran. It gets ran. It comes out. Okay, you kind of understand what quality is going on. If some alarms go off when it's in your process, you can, Six Sigma people hate this word, but you can tweak the machine and make sure that the quality gets right. Okay, you have control over that. Here's the problem in safety. People sometimes try to wedge safety into that same process, and it's really tough to do. And here's what I mean by that. On the way to work, okay, you don't know if your employee just had a fight with their spouse. Okay? You don't know if your employee just got in an accident or your employee just got some bad news. The mindset from your employees coming into work, is, it's, it, the variance in it every day is dramatic. You have no idea what it is. So what you try to do, the most important six-inch space in the world of safety is right between the ears. Okay, how do you control that? You can't really control it. You can make the employees aware of some hazards, some triggers that leave people susceptible. And here are four states that your employees should be trained on. They need to self-trigger themselves to say, am I rushing? Am I frustrated? Am I fatigued? Or am, I, or am I complaining at this given moment? If I am, an alarm should go off in their head because those four states lead to those four critical errors that could lead to an injury. Let me give you an example. I don't know if anybody has seen this video clip. This is Behavioral Injury 101 right here. You can see it coming a mile away. Okay. This video clip, Ray Magnet Wire has analyzed more any, than any video clip that we've ever done. 
Okay, this video clip had so many behavioral issues with it that it's not even funny. Every worker there was accountable for that injury and that incident happening. How many times does it happen within a facility? Very, very, very common. So people should be alerting and making people aware. Here's a behavioral incident that we had within our company. What he's lifting is literally a 90-pound empty spool. Okay, And you say, why isn't there a hoist? Well, there is a hoist. It's right over his, his cheek, his, his bottom cheek there. Okay, He's just choosing not to use it. The hoist was fine. He's just choosing not to use it. 80% of injuries that happen within a company happen because an employee is choosing to do the job incorrectly, not the ergonomics or the job design. Okay? Behavioral injuries are critical. Okay. How am I doing so far in time here? Okay. Let me, I'm going to skip forward real quick here. Sorry. Yep. I want let me talk real quickly about some common mistakes of cumulative traumas, and then you have all, these present, all this in the presentation. Okay, when I talk cumulative traumas and sprains, you're looking at uh, all, the, all the listed up top here, strains, tenosynovitis, cumulative traumas, carpal tunnels, all those good things. Now, how they happen is real simple. I'm going to give you a, about, in two minutes, an eight-year medical field here. Every muscle in the body has a blood supply going to it. Blood supply carries oxygen and sugar. Blood supply uses the oxygen and sugar to either do two things, movement or a static posture. Okay, what happens is with static posturing, you have a buildup of lactic acid. When you have a buildup of lactic acid, it's not getting carried away. You have a pooling effect. That pooling effect results in the strains and sprains, cumulative trauma disorders, anything that has an itis, which means inflammation at the end of it. That's exactly what happens. So... With that being said, let's take a look at some common issues that I see out in manufacturing. I'll make a bold statement, but it's true. If you do not want to have a shoulder injury, specifically a rotator cuff injury, when you look at job designing, keep the shoulder joint below 45 degrees. Okay, that's fact. That'll also come up on that ergonomic assessment tool as well. Here's what that is. 45 degrees is that yellow line. Okay, the reason why is you have muscle firing at a, what we call maximum voluntary contraction at 20%. It's 16% maximum voluntary contraction. That's enough to totally block off or occlude blood flow to a tissue. You get a burning knot right in the shoulder blades, which results in the strain and sprain. Now, here's some examples of that. Don't put people with hand presses to keep their arms up there. Her, her hands never came down during this process. They always had to stay up there, only, and she always brought them down during breaks. Major problems. Okay. Now, real common, I got two common things, and I'll open up the questions. We all heard of rotator cuff injuries. The most common way I've seen to get rotator cuff injuries is right here. Anybody have those pallet jacks? Okay. These pallet jacks are a nightmare. And they're a nightmare not because of how they work. They work fine. It's how we've trained people or lack of training for them. Never teach your folks to pull a pallet jack this way. Okay? What happens is if they're pulling it and it gets caught on something and it gives that quick pop motion in the back, that's enough to rip the rotator cuff right off the bone. I've seen it in the two worst patients I've ever treated that, that happened to. Okay, young people, gone. What you want to do is when they're pulling it, have them tilt their body about a 45-degree angle, and they're fine. If it goes, they're fine. Do not have them totally turn like this picture here. Major, major risk factor. Okay, and then last but not least, when it comes to sh tools, the most common mistake I see when it comes to hand tools is getting these mixed up. A pistol-shaped tool, like a drill, Okay, should be used on a vertical surface. Okay, do not mix that up. Do not put a pistol-shaped tool on a horizontal surface getting your employees to do this. Okay, you got a shoulder now at 90 degrees. You've got internal rotation. That is absolutely shoulder bursitis rotator cuff waiting to happen. And now because you're having the wrist kick towards the pinky, which is called ulnar deviation, you're going to get carpal tunnel or tendonitis, guaranteed. If you have cumulative traumas and you use tools like this, get them out of this position. If you work on a horizontal position, you want to get the ice pick type tool, inline tool is what they call. 
The only way you want to reverse that is if you've got a pistol-shaped tool and the surface they're working on is about their knee or thigh level. Then they can do that in a nice, comfortable, relaxed position. Don't get them on a bench reversing that. In two pictures, would look like this. Okay? That is absolutely nightmare cumulative trauma number one. Okay? That's number two. Okay? And that happened to be our company in 2003. Okay. I, as you can tell, I, I like to ramble, so I apologize, and you guys got a boat to catch.